I'm Dr. Stuart Hogarth. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the Department of Social Science, Health and Medicine at King's, uh, which uh, for many of you who are alumni is probably something you haven't heard of before because we're a brand new department. We're just three years old. Um, so I'd like to give a very warm welcome uh, to all the alumni that are here uh, tonight, to the staff who've come this evening, uh, and to our many friends from across the college and King's Health Partners who have uh, come today. So I'm delighted that so many of you have um, kind of ignored the warm sunshine outside and, and come into this dark and gloomy hall. Um, and I hope it's a real testament to the fact that we've chosen a subject that is compelling and interesting and important. Um, and um, before I dive into the discussion of tonight's subject, uh, there's a couple of kind of messages uh, I want to uh, share with you some exciting news from across uh, the college. And the first thing is about the research evaluation framework. As probably most of you know, we academics are now uh, every so often, every few years, uh, scrutinized uh, and evaluated for the quality of our research outputs. Um, and uh, that's a kind of very kind of uh, intense process, very worrying time for us, but I'm very pleased to share with you that the results of the 2014 research, value, uh, research excellence framework have confirmed the college in its leading uh, place as a world leading research institution. So we've risen to sixth position uh, nationally in the power ranking, which takes into account both the quality of our research but also uh, the quantity of research activity. Uh, and we've, ris we've risen to seventh position just in terms of quality uh, alone. So these very positive results further enhance King's reputation as a world leading uh, research institution, delivering real impact in tackling some of the greatest challenges facing society today, whether they're biomedical challenges, whether they're social health challenges. And tonight's discussion, we're going to kind of discuss one of those challenges, which is about how we bring the new genomic science to bear in healthcare. Um, so there's huge amount of optimism about the idea that in the wake of the Human Genome Project, we're about to enter a new genomic era in medicine, in which knowledge of our individual genetic makeup is going to drive clinical decision making in very many different ways. So there's a huge amount of hope and expectations around applying this genomic science in the clinic, huge amount of public and private investment in trying to realize the potential of the science. But there's also a significant amount of controversy as there is with many uh, new biomedical uh, technologies. So there's controversy about how much evidence do we need before we move a new genetic discovery into routine clinical practice as a diagnostic test. There's controversy about what sort of evidence that we need uh, to bring to bear in the evaluation of these new diagnostic tests. There's worry about whether when we give people knowledge about their genetic risk of common complex diseases like uh, cancer, heart disease and so forth, that we might simply create worried well uh, who are uh, unnecessarily uh, anxious about their health risks. And there's also concern about discrimination, about the idea that knowledge of our genetic makeup might be used to restrict or limit our access to health insurance or to life insurance. And in the midst of all these different controversies lies direct to consumer genetic testing, which has been the subject of uh, intense debate uh, for, for many years. Uh, and I have to say, personally, as an academic who studied the subject, I do owe something to the world of uh, direct consumer genetic testing because my most widely cited paper is on that subject. So it has done me at least uh, some professional good. So um, I think uh, at this stage, we will uh, just run a brief uh, video, um, just uh, for a minute or so, just to give you a taster of. Uh, from one of the leading companies and the chief executive uh, of that company. But as an individual, I want that opportunity now to actually take more control over my health. And that's fundamentally what we think, is that there should be more and more of these opportunities. And that, again, is the mission of, of the company. Have that opportunity to take charge. 
One of the areas that, that probably gets more, um, more of the controversy is the risk prediction. If I could tell you that you're at higher risk for breast cancer or prostate cancer, what would you do? And, and granted, it's, it's, a, it's a great debate. Some people want to know, and some people don't want to know. You don't want to know, you don't have to know. But, but we're never going to get to that, that era of preventative care if I can't find out ahead of time what, do, you know, what am I actually at risk for. So I can look at family history. There's a lot of people who don't know their family history. You know, I had, you know, my family came over from Eastern Europe. I only know one or two generations back. I have no idea what people died of, and people didn't talk about their diseases in the past. So I want to know, what am I at increased risk for? Okay, so that's Anne Wojcicki, who founded 23andMe, who are probably the, the, the kind of leading, uh, the largest uh, consumer genetics uh, company. So I've been asked just to give you a kind of uh, very brief introduction to some of the very basic uh, uh, facts about this uh, nascent industry. So, um, but before I do that, you've all been asked your opinions. Uh, about what you think about direct-to-consumer uh, genetic testing. So I want to share the poll results with you. So we asked you, first of all, do you support the principle of direct-to-consumer access to genetic testing? And so um, just about... Oh, I've got the exact figures. Uh, yeah, so 48.95% uh, said, yes, you support that idea. Um, and then 37.66% were unsure and 13.39% were uh, uh, against the uh, idea of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see through the kind of course of the discussion how that kind of uh, affects people's uh, attitudes. So then we asked a question about uh, what sort of information would you be most likely to be interested in? And the thing that people were most interested in is their susceptibility to uh, certain diseases, so risk uh, susceptibility. Uh, and the next one which uh, came up was ancestry, so the idea that you can examine your DNA on the basis of DNA, uh, your uh, genetic profile, find out something about uh, where you come from, which of the many tribes of humanity that you belong to. Um, and then 11% uh, of you were interested in uh, finding out uh, something about pharmacogenetics, so how your genetic makeup uh, is going to affect your response uh, to drugs. So there was interest in uh, kind of a range of things, but primarily in susceptibility testing. And then we asked you, what were your chief concerns uh, about this uh, market? And so the, the chief concern was about who has access to your personal genetic data. And that's something that one of our speakers, Francis, uh, Francis uh, Flintner, has uh, a special expertise in uh, and, and will be able to speak to with uh, great um, authority. Um, you were also very concerned about what patients do uh, in response to the information they get. So how are they going to kind of cope with uh, this new knowledge? Uh, is it really going to empower them or is it simply going to make them anxious, I guess, is the concern there. Uh, and then you're also concerned about how accurate uh, the tests are. And uh, I think probably linked to that then, uh, how the companies are regulated. So those are the kinds of uh, concerns uh, that you had. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit in very simple terms about what the process is. If you buy one of these tests, what happens? So you go onto the internet, you have a look at the company, you place an order. And the first thing you do is you get a sample collection uh, device, which you have to produce a fairly copious amount of saliva. Fairly copious. <laughs> it's quite a lengthy process, getting enough spit in the spittoon. OK, but that's the first thing you do. So then you mail it off, and it arrives at the laboratory. And it's analysed, but it's, it's not really this kind of process. It's something rather more technological like that. Uh, these little things. Uh, here on the end, they're microarrays, and uh, they can uh, um, test for thousands and thousands of different uh, SNPs uh, uh, genes uh, simultaneously. Okay, so we've got the laboratory analysis, and then the results will get fed into some kind of computer that's full of information about uh, the genetics of uh, disease and pharmacogenetics and so, so forth. Uh, to create an interpretation, okay? 
Uh, and uh, I think it'd probably be a more modern computer than that one. Um, and then you will get your results on the internet. And they will give you some kinds of risk scores, tell you about drug response, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the basics of the process. And then what can you test for? Well, we've got the kind of lifestyle traits, genetics kind of thing. So this one is a test for baldness. So obviously something I'm particularly interested in. I think I really need to have a test to see if the hair is maybe going to come back. Um, OK, second thing, very, very popular ancestry testing. So uh, we talked about that. Uh, a little bit earlier. Um, third thing, nutrigenetics. This was kind of in the early days of consumer genetics. A lot of companies were doing this kind of thing. So how do your genes affect how you metabolize nutrients, the things you eat and drink, in this case, uh, caffeine? And then how does that affect um, perhaps your, your risk of disease? Uh, in this case, linking kind of caffeine metabolism uh, to heart attack. Um, this test was launched on the basis of a single paper published in JAMA. There had been no replication of the link between the gene and caffeine metabolism when we launched the test. And then pharmacogenetics. So the idea that we can look at your genetic makeup and understand whether you're going to respond to a dose uh, normally or whether you actually need a lower dose or a higher dose. Uh, or, in fact, maybe you need a completely different medication. Maybe you're at risk of an adverse event. Susceptibility testing. So what is your risk of uh, falling prey to one of the many compl uh, common complex diseases uh, that are uh, things like diabetes, asthma, cancer, heart disease? And then there's the whole world that Francis lives in, which is the world of clinical genetics, which is diseases where a single gene is going to determine whether or not you get the disease. And you can use genetic testing and monogenic disorders uh, to think about carrier testing, to think about diagnostics, to do prenatal testing, uh, but also to do pre-symptomatic testing. So, for instance, Huntington's disease, a predictive test to know if you're going to get um, Huntington's disease. So there's a range of things in the clinical genetics sphere, a range of applications. Um, and then finally, one of these things that some of the companies do it's not just about giving you information, it's about using your data to further genetic research. So when you join, uh, when you uh, buy a test kit from 23andMe, uh, you're asked, do you want to be a research subject? Do you want to share your genetic data with researchers? It might be sold, to, for instance, to pharmaceutical companies uh, for clinical research. So um, I was asked to talk about where's the evidence. And, and one of the uh, important questions is, well, Evidence of what? what? What kind of evidence are we interested in? So from the perspective of the member of the public or the patient, when you order any kind of diagnostic test, you're interested really in two things. How accurate is the test? And what are you going to do with the information? How useful is it? So these are the things that we need evidence on. And when it comes to susceptibility testing for common complex diseases, the challenge that we've had uh, in recent years, as we've begun to uh, identify the genes that are involved in diseases like asthma and uh, dementia, etc., is that generally their predictive value is very low. Generally, they don't look like things that are clinically actionable, that are worth reporting on. Uh, so this has been a concern. So one of the solutions has been to try and bring all the different genes we've identified together and, and do a cumulative risk score. Uh, now, one of the problems with that is the companies have been kind of uh, um, quite varied in uh, the genes they've chosen, so you get this different scores. And this was what was found when the Government Accountability Office in the United States did a little uh, um, sneaky consumer um, test in these companies, and they found that um, for a single disease like prostate cancer, you're being told that your average risk of the disease, below average or above average risk, depending on which company you went to. So who do we trust? Who's got the right data? And then there's issues about whether these tests are predictive enough to actually uh, be uh, introduced into clinical practice, and also evidence about whether they improve clinical outcomes. Uh, so uh, increasingly people are thinking uh, about the question of uh, wanting to see data on uh, new diagnostic tests actually improving clinical outcomes before we introduce them into routine uh, clinical practice.
And that's been very true of pharmacogenetics. So we know a lot about the science of how genetics impacts on uh, drug metabolism. And some of the things that we've known, we've known for quite a long time. But what we've really lacked is well-designed, controlled studies that demonstrate that using that information in clinical practice leads to better clinical outcomes. And for that reason, health technology assessment agencies have often rejected pharmacogenetic testing. So, how should policymakers respond? Well, one thing is simply to ignore the problem and hope it will go away. Uh, or we could just ban it completely and say, no, we're not going to allow that. Alternatively, we could um, set some rules and perhaps also enforce those rules. So, kind of establish some kind of standards that this industry can work to. Now, some European countries like Germany have really gone down the route of saying that they don't want direct-to-consumer genetic testing and have passed legislation to that effect. So the German the Genetic Diagnosis Act of 2009 said that genetic testing should be done uh, by doctors. Okay, so there's a number of European countries who have gone down that route. In the United States, they've taken a slightly different approach. They've regulated these tests as diagnostic devices and the US Food and Drug Administration, who has regulatory authority over diagnostic devices, has written to the companies uh, and said, um, you must get pre-market approval from us, which the companies didn't have uh, when they were marketing. Okay, so 23andMe, the kind of leading company, filed for regulatory approval in 2012 and subsequently ran in a foul of the regulator. So uh, at the end of 2013, the FDA wrote the company a very stiff warning letter telling them to cease and desist marketing, saying that despite numerous interactions with the company explaining the evidentiary, requir evidentiary requirements uh, that uh, they needed to meet and giving them all kinds of advice about how to meet those evidentiary standards, um, that they had, as of yet, received no assurance of the analytic or clinical accuracy of the tests for their intended uses. And this was at a time when 23andMe were about to launch a massive national television advertising campaign. And that was really the trigger for the regulator to say, well, we think we've had enough uh, and we'd like some evidence, the kind of evidence we've been talking about for a long time. Okay, so that's my very brief introduction. Uh, our two uh, expert speakers are now going to uh, talk, and I'm going to, um, I'll introduce them both now, and then they can uh, come up and um, uh, speak to you. So our first speaker is uh, Professor Francis, Francis Flintner, and Francis is a consultant uh, clinical geneticist, and she's also Caldecott guardian, guardian at Guys and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation. Uh, she's got a personal chair in clinical genetics at King's College London. But as well as doing all this clinical work, Frances has been very involved in the development of policy in this area. So she was a member of the UK Human Genetics Commission, which is a government advisory body. Um, and she was involved in a working group of the uh, commission that developed some uh, guiding principles for the regulation of direct consumer genetic testing, a, a piece of work that I was um, privileged to work with Francis on. Um, and she's currently uh, a member of the commissioning advisory group for the UK Genetic Testing no Network and also the Human Genome Strategy Group. Um, okay, and our second uh, speaker is Catherine Lewis, who's Professor of Genetic Epidemiology and uh, Statistics. So Francis lives in the world of rare disease genetics and um, Catherine lives in the world of common complex diseases where the science is, is much more uh, challenging. So she's got a split post across the Division of Genetics and Molecular Medicine and at the MRC Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry uh, Centre. So her work develops and applies statistical methods to characterise the genetic contribution to human disease. Um, and she's working with clinical molecular and statistical uh, researchers. Okay, so uh, you've got the detailed biography, so I won't say any more, uh, and I'll invite Francis to, to come up to the 
Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose we're all naturally curious, um, and understanding more about our genetic makeup could be potentially very attractive for obvious reasons. And if that can be offered just a mouse click away by posting a sample of our saliva to one of these companies and paying a small fee, then why not? Just what might be contained in that Pandora's box that we're tempted to open? Will we understand the results? Can anyone understand the results? And uh, whose hands will be on our personal data? So as a clinical geneticist who's worked in the NHS for more than 30 years, I would advise anyone who is concerned about the possibility of a genetic condition in their family to seek referral to the regional genetic centre. We should be very proud of the fact here in the UK that we have one of the best networks of genetic centres in the world. And anyone for whom genetic testing is clinically indicated can have it for free. With genetic counselling, as with genetic counselling support as part of the package. So professional clinical geneticists like me and genetic counsellors, some of my colleagues are in the audience here this evening, will also take responsibility for identifying other family members for whom genetic testing may be indicated and can advise on appropriate screening, whether it's colonoscopies or serial blood tests. And they will also know about current therapeutic trials to which patients may wish to be recruited. So just why would anyone choose to pay for less? And just what do companies like 23andMe offer? Well, their marketing model's quite clever. You pay them to give them information about your own medical history, and you give them your DNA sequence, and they then sell that data to pharma and anyone else who is willing to pay. So they earn money from that at both ends. In return, they offer a nice set of computer graphics online and a few bits of genetic data that may simply be of recreational interest. They probably could have given Stuart a figure to predict how likely he was to go bald. They might give you information of reproductive interest, whether you carry one of the very limited number of cystic fibrosis mutations that they test for. And they might also offer you some medical genetic data that could be profoundly misleading. And it's this third category that worries me most. So let's suppose for a moment that you're concerned about the implications of a family history of breast and ovarian cancer. Many of you will have heard of the BRCA predisposition genes. And if you have a significant BRCA1 mutation, you have an 85% chance of developing breast cancer at some stage in your life. Now, hundreds of different mutations have been reported in the BRCA gene. But 23andMe tests for just three of those. The three, for some reason that they've chosen, are those that occur most commonly in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. So if you have one of their tests and you're found to have one of these three mutations, obviously that information is clinically important, although it'll need to be validated in an accredited lab before it can be acted upon. More worryingly, if you don't have one of those three mutations, you may be falsely reassured that you're not at increased risk. But the predictive value of that negative test is almost zero. In other words, a 23andMe negative bracket test is pretty meaningless. You might also get some other unexpected news if other family members have chosen to be tested through the same company. For example, you may discover that the man with whom you grow up, grew up and always thought of as your father doesn't share any genetic material with you and you're therefore not related. Or you might discover that you're the carrier of a vanishingly rare condition that you've never heard of, with a minimal chance that your partner also carries an alteration in the same gene, and therefore a negligible chance of having an affected child. So what? That really doesn't matter. In fact, if you pay these companies enough money, some of them will even analyze your DNA and provide dietary advice. And inevitably, the conclusion is that you should eat more fruit and vegetables. <laughs> My last concern relates to testing children. We have a proud history across Europe of protecting the child's autonomy. In other words, their right not to know. Unless genetic testing is required in childhood to influence management decisions, then we expressly avoid testing children until they're old enough to decide for themselves whether or not they want to know if they carry a genetic mutation that could affect their health in adult life. <coughs> 
despite the fact that some parents would love to know what the future holds for their child's health. It's interesting, I think 23andMe is getting quite irritated by some of the comments I've made about their product because they sent their chief medical officer to come and see me last week. <laughs> and uh, she asked me what they could do in order to improve the marketability of their tests. I pointed out that I didn't really think it was my job to tell them that. But I did express real concerns about her brag that she's tested her 11-year-old daughter for everything possible and now feels that this entitles her to tell her daughter what she should do in the future. Let's contrast that with genetic testing in the NHS. A trained professional will take a detailed family history, examine you if necessary, and seek confirmation of the diagnoses of the particular condition you're concerned about in your affected relatives. That professional will then establish whether a specific mutation has been found in the DNA of any other family member tested, in which case your DNA will be tested very specifically for that mutation. If no mutation is known, then the entire gene, whether it's the BRCA gene or whichever one other one is implicated, will be screened to see whether you have a mutation. And once a mutation is identified, you will be offered advice on clinical screening and your relatives will be invited to discuss genetic testing as well. You'll be told about screening and drug trials that are currently underway, and if you've got a BRCA mutation, advised about the option of, for example, taking tamoxifen to reduce your risk. Now, Stuart mentioned, as a member of the Human Genetics Commission, I chaired an international working group that Stuart very kindly made a major contribution to that produced a report called the Framework of Principles for the Regulation of Direct Consumer Genetic Tests. The idea was that this could provide a useful reference man manual in any jurisdiction, in any country in the world, to enable regulators to consider what might be relevant and helpful in their particular country. And we know that a number of countries found that report very useful, for example, in Australia. The report was published in 2012, but was largely ignored by our government, which, as you are no doubt aware, prefers to let markets regulate themselves. It's interesting, however, that the take-up of these over-the-counter genetic tests appears to be quite limited in the UK. I was concerned that the NHS might be overwhelmed by the worried well wanting to discuss their results. But in fact, apart from a number of very nervous journalists who ring me quite a lot, we've received remarkably few inquiries. Of course, absence of evidence that these tests are doing harm certainly does not equate to proof that they are not. Um, and my advice remains unchanged. If you have a genetic question, ask a clinical geneticist and not Google. In fact, as a clinical geneticist, I'm very happy to offer you advice for free. If you want to maximize your general health, don't smoke, don't drink too much, maintain a normal weight, take regular exercise, and eat broccoli. And keep away from over-the-counter genetic tests. Thank you. Thank you to Stuart and Francis uh, for the uh, introduction. Um, I'm wondering if I can lose the, yeah, uh, the yeah. banning letter because uh, that's, uh, I'm going to talk from a rather different perspective, uh, certainly from what you've um, heard from Francis. Oh, thank you, my technological bit. Thank you. So um, I come at this not from a, a clinical perspective, as Francis um, does. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a statistician. My uh, research uh, field is in statistical uh, genetics. Uh, and my research group, we're based partly here in the tower at Guy's, which many, many of you may know, and partly at the Institute of Psychiatry um, down by King's College Hospital at Denmark Hill. Um, and we analyze the data that comes out of genetic research studies. And those are huge uh, studies. Um, and most of them are these genome-wide association studies that Stuart talked about right back at the beginning, where we're using the research to identify those genetic variants that contribute to risk of disease. And again, I'm not so much focusing on the rare disorders that Francis talked about, but I'm talking about those common complex disorders. Um, and also pharmacogenetic studies uh, control and response uh, to drugs. Now, 
Remember that DNA is three billion base pairs long. So as a statistician, that's fantastic. That gives us a huge amount of data to analyze. And obviously many of those base pairs in DNA are, are invariant between individuals. But there are millions of sites in, the, in that DNA that varies between us, that one person may carry a, a copy of a, a T base there and others may carry an A. And it's those very subtle changes that make many of the differences between us. So it controls our risk to disease and we're just starting to chip away at identifying those. It's those changes in DNA that give me my slightly curly hair, my average height along with my bad 1970s diet. Um, but you know, those are the things that control so much of our person and our health. But each of those variants has a very mild modifying effect on disease. It's not a yes, no, um, that you're at high risk of breast cancer or you're not. We're interested in those variants that slightly increase or decrease your risk of disease. And it's a cumulative effect across hundreds or probably thousands of variants that will tell us that if we're at increased risk, of rheumatoid arthritis, of schizophrenia, of depression. And the studies that we're doing are starting to identify those genetic variants that then move into the susceptibility tests that, that you heard about um, through 23 um, and me. Um, and most of the diseases that we're really worried about that have a big burden on the NHS and on society are those common complex disorders. So anything that we can do through genetics to help us treat them better, to help predict them better, could have a major impact on many people's lives. Um, but I will admit we are right at the beginning of doing that at the moment. And as a statistician, I got interested in genetic testing from the perspective of risk estimation. How can we use the genetic information that we have at the moment to estimate accurately and appropriately someone's risk of those diseases um, that, I've just that I've just mentioned? And currently we can do that very poorly. We know too little about the underlying genetic susceptibility. Although we are getting there, I was reading a paper yesterday on celiac disease where researchers are saying that we now have 50% of the genetic underpinnings of celiac disease. And that's a figure that even a few years ago, we would never have dreamt that was possible. So we now have the genetic technology, we have the tools, we have the th high throughput genotyping machines, and we're developing the research studies with the large numbers of patients that we need to identify those genetic variants. But along with that uh, statistical professional interest, I got personally interested in it. I sent off my spit sample to 23andMe about three or four um, years ago, and it does take a huge amount of spit to fill that tube. I agree with Stuart there. And I found the results that I got back fascinating. Not so much for what they told me about my risk of disease, because most of those risks were very slightly elevated or very slightly reduced. We just don't know at the moment to give us really predictive information. But this idea that that was my genetics that it was telling me about on that screen, that's incredibly <coughs> personal. And for the first time, we have the ability to have an insight into that. And yes, we have to be very careful. We have to make sure that we use it properly, that people understand what it's about. But I feel that there's no going back. That genie is out of the bottle, and we have the potential to find out about our genetic underpinnings. It's going to be very difficult to say no to that. Uh, and so my perspective on this is that what we need to do is to learn to use that appropriately to make sure that we're a genetically literate community who can interpret 
things like the, the figures and the results that 23 and me are giving and know what to do about that, whether it's to go to your GP or whether it's just to say, oh, that's interesting, um, and move on to um, look at something else on the web. And I feel we're clearly not there yet, but as a society, I see finding out about our genetics as part of this quantified self movement. This idea that we measure so many things about us, ourselves, whether it's our calorie intake, our weight, our cholesterol um, levels, and, and how many people like me have tracking devices? No? Yes, yes, <laughs> thank you. And that is the perspective I see genetics. It's a way of finding out more about ourselves than we have ever been able to do in previous generations. Thank you. Great, okay, so uh, some fantastic contributions from uh, Francis and, and Catherine. So I'm going to now act as chair of the kind of rest of the session. Uh, well, I'm going to wear two hats. I'm going to be chair, I'm going to uh, pose some questions, uh, invite questions from you, uh, but I'm also going to um, chip in and, and, and give my views uh, as well. So I've got some pre-prepared questions I've been supplied with. Um, that I'll uh, in, invite comment on from the panel. Um, but um, uh, I want to move fairly quickly uh, over to giving you an opportunity to um, uh, let us hear your ideas and, and, and pose some questions uh, to us. Um, so I think uh, one question I'd like to start with is just this uh, heterogeneity that we have, different types of uh, tests. We've got uh, the, the world of clinical genetics, monogenic disorders. Uh, we've got susceptibility testing that you've just been talking about. We've got pharmacogenetics, etc. cetera. Um, I'd like us maybe just to explore a little bit the different issues these raise in terms of how we might think about policy responses and, and, and what we think the best way of kind of uh, tackling, tackling them are. Um. <laughs> They're all very different from each other, aren't they? Um, I suppose the first question I would always want to ask, assuming that the results are scientifically valid, and of course that's what people like Catherine Lewis established for us so carefully, the next question before we start discussing offering them to patients also should be, do they actually have clinical utility? Will they help with this patient's management? Um, and if so, who is appropriately qualified to discuss with the patient the pros and cons of having that sort of genetic test, what the results might show, and what the consequences of having that test might be. And things are changing very fast. Um, if you look back 10 or 15 years, clinical geneticists and genetic counselors thought they were the only people who should be offering genetic tests. In the current climate, of course, that is simply no longer sustainable. Every clinician in every part of this hospital needs to know enough about genetic tests that are relevant to their particular specialty that they can ensure that the right patient gets the right genetic test at the right time. We can provide help and advice and support for that, and we can support the laboratories who are doing that testing. But I'm certainly not going to claim that only we can appropriately offer genetic tests. I think the area of pharmacogenetics is a really interesting one, and one where we're seeing the greatest progress, actually probably in oncology. Um, so treatment of patients with cancer and learning more about the genetic makeup of these patients and particularly the alterations that they have in the malignant cells in their body is beginning to enable us to target chemotherapy for those patients very, very accurately. So there are established models for um, evaluating um, drugs that can be used, and we have the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and so on, that can look at drugs and decide whether they are helpful and offer them to patients. I think for that sort of thing, we have the right regulation in place. As far as genetic tests to diagnose rare genetic disorders is concerned, we have the very effective UK Genetic Testing Network, which makes recommendations to commissioners as to which tests should be offered, by whom, and in which circumstances. The vacuum in this country is for tests that can be offered over the counter that might be rather more of a mishmash, mismash, a, a mixture of medical tests, predisposition tests, ancestry tests, um, and so on. And you could argue that maybe in those tests don't necessarily lead <coughs> to that much harm, but sometimes they can do, and that's where I think we have a problem. <laughs> 
Hey, I, um, I, I warned Stuart before we started, policy is not my area. I'm a statistician. And what's the first question? It's policy. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, Francis is the expert here. I, I perhaps wanted to add something about the scientific accuracy of mm. these tests. And, and you know, Stuart showed a test about differences between um, companies. Um, and I think this harks back to one of the points that I made is that uh, we are very early in this stage of genetic testing and precisely what handful of SNPs, uh, genetic variants, each company chooses to test makes a big difference to the figures that come out at the end. And I think this is something that will disappear as we move further into you know, um, having a much more solid scientific basis um, for that. Um, but the other statistical concern that I have is that um, the, the results were written up there as, you know, increased risk, decreased risk. Well, what does that actually mean? To me as a statistician, that doesn't tell me very much at all. Um, and one of the, the problems um, I have with the way that the results are presented in 23andMe is that you tend to just get one number. But actually, there's a lot of unknown information around that. And actually, what we probably need is a range of information. And we need to know that, yes, given the noise and our unknowingness, you do have an elevated risk compared to the rest of the population, whatever that population might mean, whether it's compared to other women, other men, and that's another challenge, I think, in, in designing appropriate tests here. But I think there are a lot of um, statistical subtleties that we need to make sure that are put into this test in, in developing them and that we know about in order to interpret them as well. So, um, Catherine, just uh, stay on the subject of susceptibility testing, and um, the uh, you know uh, you kind of uh, gave us a very clear picture of uh, progress in the science. We know as well that we've got amazing progress in the technology in terms of the kind of cost and the speed at which we can sequence uh, an individual's uh, genome, which is helping the research. Um, but you also said uh, place great emphasis on the idea that we're right at the beginning. You nevertheless had a lot of confidence that as knowledge increased, these things would become clinically useful. Uh, and I just want to push you a bit harder on that because um, the, the idea of early intervention, preventive medicine, uh, is one that's been increasingly kind of challenged in the last few decades. And increasingly we've thought about, for instance, screening asymptomatic patients as something that often brings uh, harms as well as benefits and something that needs to be very rigorously evaluated. So I just want uh, your perspective as a scientist who's developing this knowledge on, on, on how we address those kinds of challenges about right. translation. Okay, so maybe I could pick up on this screening um, idea that, that you brought up. I mean, currently, you know, we have many screening tests. You could think of mammograms and, and smears, and they're offered sort of universally across the population. So all women within certain age groups will will be offered, you know, three yearly mammograms, and that's a very coarse division of the population by sex and by age. But if we have also useful genetic information that shows it may not be predictive like the BRCA1 and 2 mutations that, that Francis was talking about that give you a very high risk, which is immediately clinically actionable, but perhaps we should be using genetics to stratify people, to say, well, you know, your risk of breast cancer from common variants in the population is fairly low. So, okay. Maybe you shouldn't start mammograms at 47 and have them every three years, but you perhaps need to start a little later and have them less frequently. And this then will give less false positive results, which you know, have, have great problems, and would enable us to then focus our resources on people who are at higher risk and perhaps should start earlier and have mammograms um, more more often, um, and I, you know, I've used the breast cancer and mammogram screening example just because it's something that we're all familiar with and it's a model that, that we can see would work. But that's a way that we can use genetics in a very effective way that doesn't necessarily need it to be 
clinically actionable in having a very high risk of developing the disease. It's, it's using appropriate information. Um, so I'd like to kind of raise the whole question of um, whether we think there's anything in this kind of uh, broad panoply of uh, um, genomic knowledge that we can uh, now access, or genomic data, I should say. Um, anything that we think, well, maybe direct to consumers, not the appropriate route. Maybe that's something that should only be available via, uh, via a doctor, a healthcare professional, because the clinical consequences are such that um, you really need uh, the learned intermediary there uh, to, uh, to explain and, and, and so forth. Francis, do, do you have any views on that? I would be surprised to hear that my preference would always be that for um, tests that have medical significance, um, they should be offered by an appropriately qualified healthcare professional. But I think I've already made it clear that that doesn't need to be a geneticist. Um, Paediatricians in district general hospitals are extremely good at assessing children with developmental delay and then discussing with their parents as a first line test. Um, doing a very detailed chromosome analysis to see if there's any subtle change that might explain why that child has developmental delay. Um, I think the other important thing is that it's not only the question of somebody being able to explain to the patient why the test is being done, but making sure that they choose the appropriate test, that they are able to discuss the results and the implications of that result with the patient, and that they take responsibility for follow-up afterwards, whatever the appropriate follow-up might be, whether it's referring somebody into a screening program or cascade testing, ex extending cascade testing to other members of the family. Uh, I think there are responsibilities associated with all of that, that companies that offer these tests direct to consumer over the internet completely absolve themselves of, and I think that's very, very sad. So Catherine, I mean, you, you talked uh, about the thrill of kind of engaging with your own genomic data when, when you did the 23andMe test. What, what's your perspective on this? Is it kind of uh, no holds barred, anything goes, or? No, I, even I would not go that far. And, and for example, I've chosen not to look at my results for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease because that, that was an area that I decided I did not want to know. Um, one of the key points here, we've talked about research in identifying genetic predisposition to disease, to drug response, but I think this area of genetic testing itself is an area that we need research in. We need to find out what is the best way to communicate genetic results to patients, what sorts of things are appropriate to offer over the internet, and what should be retained for clinical geneticists. Uh, and I think until we, we understand more about how people react to these findings, what they do downstream, how many of those worried well are coming into GPs and, and to France's clinic, I think we need much more information to be able to make the right judgment about you know, exactly where that cutoff should be or where that gray zone should be of what's acceptable in direct-to-consumer and, and what is a purely clinical area. I completely agree with that, but I would add that every patient is different. Their background knowledge and understanding of genetics will vary hugely. And when you see somebody face-to-face -to, -face to discuss genetic testing, part of the process is just to test out how much of what you've said have they understood. Now, I demonstrated once very clearly that a patient I'd spent half an hour talking to hadn't understood what I'd said because he was a chap who had Marfan syndrome, which is dominant, so a 50-50 risk to his children of being affected. And when I asked him what his understanding of that risk was, his answer was, well, it's like the national lottery, isn't it? You either win or you don't. So I thought, well, now I know why people buy national lottery tickets. <laughs> but clearly in his mind, it was a bipolar outcome. It was either yes or no. And he had absolutely no concept of relative weighting. And, and I think you also see that if you go onto the 23andMe website, there are patient forums. And you can see in those some of the ways that people interpret their results correctly or incorrectly. And as a statistician, I'm always worried about the lack of statistical literacy in the population, that if you give person, people a risk of something, they don't really know how to interpret that number. You know, what does a risk of 50% of developing something, you know, really mean? Uh, and uh, as Francis' example. The only people who are really good at risk are those who gamble. <laughs>
and those who put money on the horses, and they will understand the difference between one in three, three to one, th you know, immediately they are very numerate, but most of us are not very good at that. So, um, before we open it up to the floor, I just uh, wanted to pick up something outside the health area, which is ancestry testing, and, and Catherine, this is something that you're interested in as well. That, um, could you just tell us a little bit about uh, what you think the potential benefits and harms, the limitations, uh, of testing in this area are? So 23 and me have, have um, substantially expanded what they do with ancestry testing in, in the last uh, range of tests that they put out. And, and Stuart showed this nice sort of blue graph of um, uh, which, uh, and blue is their color for European ancestry. And mine looks incredibly dull. I'm blue around that whole circle. But people with more mixed ancestry, it is very insightful for them as to exactly what areas of the world that their ancestry comes from. And we now have a lot of population data from multiple different populations across all the continents that they then compare the genetic data from each individual to uh, and, and measure up against that ancestry. And, and people obviously find that hugely um, yeah, informative. Um, I should say one of the strengths of ancestry testing in 23andMe is that they use the whole genome, so all the different chromosomes. Other companies that you see advertising online quite heavily look only at the Y chromosome, which really for men just tells you about your father's father's father. So it's a very limited ancestry snapshot and similarly uh, with females for mitochondrial DNA. Um, but it's clearly a huge area um, of interest and in why many people um, do direct to consumer testing. Um, but, and the other area of interest is genealogy. So people have been tracing their family trees through you know, church records for, for generations. And now people are starting to use genetics to identify far-flung relatives around the world and fill in gaps in their family tree, um, which for many people is really interesting. And, and on, again, 23andMe website has really heartwarming stories about adopted children who've managed to trace their um, blood families um, through genetic testing. But as Francis mentioned, there's also a flip side there. You have run the risk of finding out you know, that you have a half sibling you know, that your parents never wanted you to find out about. Uh, and I think that's an area we have to be really well aware of. Um, apparently, according to 23andMe, I have 564 fourth degree cousins uh, on their data set. I, I've not felt inclined to get in touch with anyone. Okay, <laughs> that, that is a fairly long Christmas card list. Um, <laughs> So uh, at this stage, uh, I open uh, the discussion up to the floor. Uh, uh, we have roving microphones. Uh, very conveniently, I've got two people raise their hands on the same row, uh, just on uh, the right here, and various people on the left that we can come to. Uh... Now, I have to say the last remarks actually made a more positive impression than the original remarks. Uh, I came as a completely undecided uh, group, but I have to tell you that these original remarks horrified me. They horrified me because it's a serious business about genetics. I mean, uh, it's all right having uh, your romantic imagery sort of, of uh, but uh, the, the, the real situation is that, uh, is the accuracy of the tests and whether or not uh, I can do anything about it. Uh, and, and you illustrated that very well, actually, by saying, well, uh, on two of the incurables, you didn't want to know about it. And that's exactly the situation. Uh, it will depend upon the information that you get uh, and whether you can do anything about it as to whether this is of any use whatsoever. Uh, it's not a game. Uh, the ancestry part, I think, is more interesting and it is m more a, a, a question of fun. But the question about uh, whether or not you are really going to be liable to a serious disease and, and, uh, is, is in a different ballpark. So uh, I am horrified, actually, at the lax attitude that the companies seem to be sort of uh, showing, uh, being very selective, probably because of uh, 
it just doesn't pay to to have very elaborate uh, sort of tests um, that that you can have a, a essentially worthless bit of, bit of information generated if you've got three out of how many are, uh, uh, for this uh, 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 breast cancer. So um, I, I have to say I've come uh, with a reaction that uh, I wouldn't touch these uh, tests with the barge pole uh, uh, until things have got very, very much more accurate. The, the, the change, for example, the difference in, 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 in different companies, I mean, sort of, uh, it, it's, it just horrifies me. Okay, so. well, I'm glad none of us are on commission. Um, so, the gentleman, just to the, the right there, uh, Hannah. Um, you, Stuart, you'd put up some countries. Um, I'd like to know what the nuances between them are. Germany says no to this, which is probably wise. Second thing, for Catherine, I'd say, this is going to be a minefield like um, climate change. Lawson knows all about climate change, and we're supposed to listen to what he says. He hasn't got a clue about statistics. And this goes a long way in disinformation about climate change. So I would ask Francis to say, when you get your policies across, you've got to be very stern with government. We can't have a free-for-all as we've had in climate change with more ignorance than anything else. And I would plead for that. Uh, vote Labour if you want your, uh, <laughs> if you want your uh, report to be reinvest, uh, reassessed. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we were we still under Labour when we finished that, Francis? No, we were not. And in uh, fact, what the government did was in the bonfire of the Quangos, they abolished the Human Genetics Commission uh, just uh, as it produced its final report. I have to say, though, that uh, the first report from the Human Genetics Commission on direct to consumer genetic testing uh, did come out under Labour and uh, sat on a shelf gathering dust for, uh, for some years. But yes, gentlemen on the left here, gosh, so many people. We'll my, that gentleman at the back after this. my question is a very simple, practical one. Can genetic testing do anything to help people with urological problems apart from the cancer? Um, so there is some interesting research going on into um, reflux, children who, and, and uh, the people generally go out of it, so it's primarily children when they try and empty their bladder, the urine reflux is towards the kidney and they can get recurrent urinary tract infections and then scar their kidneys. And it looks as if that is an inherited predisposition. The, we're trying to map genes that are relevant to that, but actually at the moment, uh, the way we manage those children is if they have a parent who had reflux, we presume they have a 50-50 chance of having inherited that predisposition. At a young age, they have a particular type of um, scan which will show whether they have reflux, and if they do, they put on low-dose long-term prophylactic antibiotics until they grow out of it. That's probably the best example that I can think of um, that's not relating to cancer. I mean, obviously, I'm not a cancer geneticist, um, but there has been a lot of work done looking at certain inherited um, uh, predispositions to developing prostate cancer. But, of course, many cases of prostate cancer are not the consequence of a familial predisposition. It is just a common condition in older men. Right, we've got a gentleman, uh, several, okay, we've got a microphone. Hello, I, um, um, I wanted to ask the companies that 23andMe sell data to, um, who are they and what are they hoping to do with the data? Is it the entire, is it the genetic material and the whole genome? Or is it all these tiny incremental risks that don't tell you very much? And are they hoping to find a new market or a new um, way of selling things? So the example that the, Chief Medical Officer of 23andMe gave me last week is that there was a company that was interesting in, interested in developing a product for the treatment of stretch marks. Um, and they have, uh, the, the theory was that people who had an alteration in a gene called the fibrillin gene might be more at risk of developing stretch marks. So 23andMe emailed everybody who had this particular variant in the fibrillin gene and asked them if they had any stretch marks. And within something like 24, 48 hours, it had thousands and thousands of replies. And they then sold that information to this cosmetics company that hopes to develop um, 
a special treatment. Now, quite why anybody would consider having genetic testing to see if they're at risk of stretch marks, I can't imagine. <laughs> but apparently, that data was worth, I think she said, $5 million to 23andMe. Um, so we've got some more people at the back, but what I'm going to do, we've got people in the middle who've had their hands up for a while. This gentleman on the left, Hannah, and then the lady on the right, and then we've got people at the front who've also, that will come down to, and then we'll come back to the back. Yep. I'd like to explore how fast one could advance science in this area. Uh, is it a question of maximizing the numbers of people whose uh, genetic composition you have access to? And uh, if I give an example, would something along these lines help? Uh, suppose that for 20 pounds or something like that, people could have their ancestry tested and on the basis that they had to answer about 10 questions which were uh, questions about uh, they and their families, um, diseases of various sorts, fairly simple, something like 10 questions, uh, but they wouldn't be given any of that information, they would be doing that in the interests of science but they would get their ancestry tested at that very cheap rate. What do you think about that idea? Okay, so we've got two things there. We've got a scheme for enrolling people in research, but then the first question was really a statistical one about the powering of studies to find, I guess, unravel the genetics of common diseases. So I can answer that fairly quickly. Yes, it's all about big numbers, that we're looking for very subtle effects of each gene, and the larger the data sets, they don't the more we're going to find those. So I'm a proud research participant in 23andMe because I've seen how much good research comes out of that, that company. And it, it's clearly very valid, it's very well done. They have excellent scientists who I regard as peers on their staff doing it. Um, but some of the big studies are gonna be things like the UK Biobank, which has half a million people, and genetic data is being developed on those over the next few years. And so uh, that size of data set we're hoping would be, will be a huge advance. So, Catherine, I just wanna explore one issue around there, which I remember when Biobank launched, I was at the Department of Public Health and Primary Care at Cambridge University. So a lot of people who'd been involved in the EPIC project, so they were at the cutting edge of uh, gathering phenotypic data, so particularly dietary data, new, uh, new kind of techniques and everything. And what they emphasized was just the amount of resource you need to gather high quality information about things like diet so that you can explore lifestyle gene interactions. So there's a trade-off about how many people you can do that for because of the cost. So there's a kind of, there's, yeah. there's some difficulties there. But yes, lady on the right. Thank you. Um, it's interesting to have both sides of the um, discussions on this, and I do find myself um, sort of in the middle of it. My particular area is personalized nutrition, and um, the way I would like to, to use genetic testing, having indeed sort of started to look at it, is to really identify susceptibility and predisposition to either a disease condition or simply when we're looking at weight management um, and that sort of thing. Now, where we can really start making a difference on the preventative side is where we're starting to look at how diet and lifestyle can help to address that predisposition and susceptibility. So, you know, are there things you can do with your diet and lifestyle that can try and avert that slightly increased risk of developing Alzheimer's or dementia or any other condition. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are about that, where we're really look at it, looking at it from a diet and lifestyle perspective and really a preventative measure, which the way things are at the moment is, is really a key, key feature, a key area. I think we know enough about what constitutes a healthy diet to be able to give people really first-class dietary recommendations without going anywhere near their genome. On the whole, any variation that there might be in their DNA that might alter the way they metabolize things, for the vast, vast majority of people will make only a very tiny, tiny difference to their predisposition. And actually encouraging them to eat a normal balanced diet in the context of more generally a healthy lifestyle is going to have far more effect on their overall health than pseudoscience and pretending that because you know they've got a particular variant that they should eat a bit more broccoli than their next door neighbor. <laughs> 
Do you not think that if they know that that is their genetic disposition, it might help with sort of more adherence and No, I don't. And, and, and actually, there's been some interesting research that shows that almost paradoxically it goes the wrong way. Teresa Marteau, who, who used to work here, um, did some work looking at hypercholesterolemia, which is one area where actually your genetic makeup can um, have a very significant effect um, on how readily you can metabolize um, fat in your diet. And in some people, what it showed is that if you tell them that they're genetically predisposed to have high cholesterol levels, they think, oh, what the heck, you know, I'm damned anyway, and they start having an English breakfast every morning. <laughs> So um, we are kind of, uh, the clock is running down, so I'm going to ask for quick questions and quick answers. We're going to come down the front. We've got a lady on the left here, um, and then two people in front of her, and then we'll go up to the back again. Yep. Could you say a bit about gene therapy? I'm thinking, you've said that most of the traits that you discover are a question of um, uh, more or less, um, but something like CF where there is definite gene involved. I know there are several CF genes, but say there is a particular one that is making that person to be CF. Would, how possible is it that you could discover that gene and replace it with a healthy one? Okay, anyone in the panel confident about talking about gene therapy? I'll Aside answer from seeing very, very promising signs, but brief. we're... Uh, um, People have been trying to develop gene therapy for cystic fibrosis for a very long time because it's one of the organs you can target relatively easily because you just need to breathe stuff in to get it into your lungs. But it doesn't matter which particular mutation you have in the cystic fibrosis gene. There's only one gene but thousands of mutations. But actually getting an intact, correct copy of the cystic fibrosis gene into the lungs and getting it incorporated there without doing other damage is proving to be exceptionally difficult. And there have been, there are gene therapy trials in a number of areas, particularly in hematological disorders. Um, and actually what they find sometimes is that it's partially effective, but then the patients develop other consequences. And there was a trial in Paris, I can't remember what they were treating, but some of the children who'd had successful gene therapy for one condition then went on to develop leukemia. Okay, so unfortunately, um, it's very difficult. Going to move us on. The gentleman on the second row. Uh, yep, are you still? Oh no. Ah, right. So gentleman <laughs> in the front row then. Excellent. Right. Um, hi, I've got, I'm a doctor that works with kids by background. Um, is anyone from 23andMe here by any chance? Good. Last week I went to a talk by Anne Wojcicki at Oxford by 23andMe, and interestingly, it was presented in a very positive very empowering, she's a great speaker. I went in there open-minded but sceptical, appropriately sceptical, I would say, and it's exciting, it really is exciting, but it's painted in a very straightforward, black and white, very colorful for what it is, black and white way, that, you know, n knowledge is power, and power means that you can be healthier, essentially, but it was a very mixed audience as well, actually, from various disciplines um, and the public. And generally speaking, everyone bought into it, apart from three people who were doctors. <laughs> One brought up the point about the BRCA genes and that they only test for the Ashkenazi Jews ones and the implications of that for the rest of the population. And I brought up a point about, well, they're offering... One, they're painting it in a very grey thing in a very black and white way, which is not fair. And two, that they're offering population-wide screening without any of the safeguards, essentially, is what they're doing. Um, and they've already tested almost a million people so far, predominantly in the US. And there is going to be a big push by 23andMe in this country now. And they are planning it and, they, it, is, and it is gaining momentum, but we don't have any of the safeguards. And this is quite sensitive potentially quite powerful information that is being given to people and they will give you your whole genome data because one of the doctors there got given his whole genome data and put it through a different system and got an entirely bigger set of predispositions and data and he didn't understand the implications of it. So what my worry is, is what can we do to give people some safeguards to say, I know Germany's already put in legislation what are we going to do? Because it's going to become... We're not seeing the implications of it yet, but we will start to see it very, very soon. OK, so I think what we'll do is when we wind up, we'll just come back to what should the policy response be. But I'd like to get to the back of the room and, and pick up some of the people there. Gentlemen at the far end, and, and, and then you, sir, with glasses. 
Um, it was mentioned that there's a need for statistical literacy, but I think also there's a, very much a need for conceptual literacy in terms of um, concepts of disorders such as mental disorders that have uh, a wide gene basis. Um, and a lot of those concepts have been built out of social circumstances rather than, one could say, hardwired to biological functions in the first place. And then to, I suppose the question is, um, what would you do with that data if, if, if you did find a, a, a group in society that could be said were different genetically with mental disorders? You mentioned risk. What risk does that pose to that population? Well, we group? already know about quite a lot of um, neurodevelopmental predisposition genes, which increase people's likelihood of developing mental health problems, but make it by no means inevitable that they will develop them. Um, and that is why, for example, when we are testing samples prenatally to look for chromosome abnormalities, we deliberately set the software filter so that it doesn't generate that sort of information because it is profoundly unhelpful. But when people present with mental health problems and samples are sent in for genetic testing, testing that is done may sometimes reveal that they do have an inherited variant, which probably in part explains why they have mental health problems. But I completely agree with you. Genetics is not purely deterministic. And actually, what many of the other things that will have happened to them in their lives will also be making an important contributing factor. So I have a friend who, who does research on uh, newborn screening and also screening of uh, a testing of children. And uh, one of the areas she's been concerned about is increasing use of genetics to give a, an autism diagnosis. And uh, so one of the trends that we're seeing, and this is within the health system, uh, is parents who have a concern about their child wanting a kind of genetic diagnosis in order to try and make sure that they get access to enhanced educational resources uh, for their children. So there, there are multiple ways that this is kind of uh, spilling out and uh, affecting our uh, welfare system. So there's a gentleman at the back on the right there with glasses. Hannah, can you get, get to him? Uh, so I'm not at the back, about halfway up. And then I think this might be about our final question, because I'm... Um, my concern with direct-to-consumer genetic testing is that they are invested, I think, in deterministic language, and that masks the complexity of a lot of the information that's coming out of genomics. And, Catherine, you talked about the need for genetic literacy. I think if we are invested in... We need new ways of talking about genetics that moves away from deterministic language in order to get to grips and become genetically literate, but the marketing for direct-to-consumer genetic testing is invested in it being deterministic. So how do we find new ways or exciting ways of getting people to embrace the complexity of genomics? I think one of the challenges with the companies is, you know, sometimes, quite often on their websites, they'll use quite nuanced language about, um, you know, it's not just about your genes and, and, and so forth. Um, but then when you see them kind of doing uh, PR stuff on television, then they talk about, well, you've got the broccoli gene. And, and there's this, this kind of, uh, which is the kind of gene that predisposes you to um, uh, not like the taste of broccoli. Um, uh, so they will bring in this kind of, it's the broccoli gene, it's deterministic kind of, in this kind of casual discourse. So, uh, and I think that's one of the real kind of challenges from a regulatory perspective, that uh, you might be able to think about um, regulating the kind of way they present information and ensuring it's based on uh, solid science and so forth, but the very broad claims that they make, the kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of more difficult to kind of uh, control that language, I suspect. Have we got any final questions? Yes, gentlemen here. I have actually. I've talked to um, actuaries over the last couple of years, um, and they were very worried about genetics. Um, uh, and then they are quite reassured by what I say that we are not there yet. Um, and so, yeah, and, and so they're quite reassured that some of the things that they are allowed to ask about, you know, like sex and family history and things, and, and that they use to that level of information that they use, 
is much more predictive currently um, than, than genetics. So. Can I just make a point that there is actually a moratorium on the use of genetic test results at the moment, and there has been for many years, and the only genetic test result that insurance companies are allowed to ask for is the result of a test for Huntington's disease and only for policies that are quite large, worth over a certain amount. Um, and the ABI has responsibility for overseeing that, but companies are not allowed to ask about the results of genetic tests, and if customers tell them about them by mistake, they're not allowed to take any notice of them. Having said that, of course, they can ask you about your own health, your family history, whether or not you smoke. So there's plenty of other ways that they can get information that will help determine what your likely life expectancy is. Um, so at that stage then, I have, uh, um, it's uh, 8.04, I think I have to wind things up. I'd like uh, to thank you all for coming and uh, also to uh, thank you for your very interesting questions uh, and comments. I'd like to thank uh, the two speakers who've been uh, uh, fantastic and uh, uh, very helpful. Um, and uh, please do fill in the feedback forms uh, that you were given uh, on arrival. Um, and I need to highlight the upcoming alumni weekend, which is going to be the 12th to the 14th of June, if it isn't already in your diaries. Uh, and there's further information about that uh, in the handouts. Uh, I do hope that we see you again at future uh, events. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.